Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Sean Rogers. I'm a Chief Research Officer for Dell, um, and I do a lot of work on the big data side, and I'm joined today by Anthony Dina. Anthony's the Director of Big Data Enterprise, um, a technologist on that side of our business. So do you have my, uh, is my, can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Well, let's jump into this. Are you prepared for the future of data technologies? So it's a, you know, it's a wild, wild world right now. There's a, an awful lot of change underfoot, a lot of things happening that are pretty interesting. We do a little bit of research here at Dell and it gives us insights into the space and hopefully it'll do the same for you um, off of our global technology uh, index this year. Organizations that are actively using big data grew 50% faster than companies that don't. And the takeaway for me on this is, is that a a lot of new technologies, frankly, you know, they get kind of buzzed to death by, by reporters and the press and, and vendors. Um, we like to, you know, latch onto these themes. But the bottom line is, is big data is definitely proving out that it helps companies innovate, helps companies new, do new and interesting things. As a matter of fact, a little bit of comparison, the number of organizations who understood the benefit um, or agree with the benefit uh, continues to grow. And it's, so it's, I think sometimes a little surprising, especially around a topic like big data that's difficult sometimes to define. Uh, I'm sure you've heard lots of different definitions of it. Vendors talk about it in different ways. For me, it gets down to that information that we used to ignore, right? This data that was in the enterprise that was a little too difficult, a little too expensive, a little too hard for us to work with. Uh, we probably knew it was there. There are some new data types that are interesting, right? Social and other things that have come into play. But the bottom line is, is what big data really is, it's information and the use thereof when we put it against our traditional systems kind of forced to look at new solutions because those traditional systems aren't up to what we're asking them to do. And that's kind of a nice overlay for this topic, I think. So, um, you know, it also becomes fuel uh, in, a, in an interesting way. And I, I'm sure you've heard uh, people talk, our CEO, Michael Dell, has talked uh, publicly quite often about the impact of, of the digital economy and how companies are doing things with data in ways that you've never seen before. Um, and that's kind of interesting. Companies that have spent most of their duration or their time uh, doing simple things like manufacturing, you know, we make this metal thing, right? Or we produce this type of an automobile or, or we produce X, Y, or Z. They're starting to look at the data that they have on hand and it's allowing them to innovate on a couple of different axes that are very interesting and can be very prop, uh, profitable or, or drive innovation in ways that perhaps you didn't think about doing uh, in the past. So using data as an asset, if you're not thinking about that in your company right now, if you don't have a strategy or perhaps your culture isn't kind of swinging in that direction, you really do need to stand back and it opens up a great opportunity for you as professionals in the field to kind of look at what kind of data you have and start to think about ways that you might be able to create new products, new services, or optimize uh, the things that you're already doing. You know, all too often, technologists and vendors stand in front of groups like you and they go, well, let me tell you about how you should throw out everything you've already done because we've got the brand new solve all thing. And you know, and I think where big data fits isn't about rip and replace. It's not about throw out what you've done. It's look for ways to actually extend or add value to what you're presently doing. You know, bringing new data into play and being able to analyze it in new ways is something that helps you uh, differentiate yourself. Not every one of your competitors in your market is looking at data as a currency, as an asset and treating it as such. If you're the first or second in your space to start doing that, you're going to find yourself in a commanding position that's you know, pretty darn interesting. A little bit more talking about, you know, are you prepared? Are you thinking about this on the theme that I, you know, was just talking about IoT, 50% of organizations see it as important. Can I see hands? Who here is thinking about doing an IoT project right now? Well, just a couple in the room. Does anybody already have one underway? Yeah, so we're still early with IoT. IoT to me is a subset of the big data issue, right? It's brand new data. Sometimes to be honest, it's wonderfully old data, traditional information that's been in the enterprise for a long time, but not data that we were able to leverage. Now the systems are allowing us to do that. Database sprawl, does anybody here have more data than they had yesterday? It's after lunch, I'm just checking to make sure everybody's paying attention, right? We're all dealing with growing data, we're dealing with database sprawl. 
we're stretching the people in our organizations and we've been asking data platforms to do things that they weren't necessarily designed to do from the beginning and it's forcing us to kind of align ourselves to putting the right data in the right place for the right purpose for the right advantage oftentimes that advantage can be around i want deeper insights or i want an advantage of speed or i'm looking for an advantage of economy all of those things sort of play around uh, the big data space. And this just kind of goes on and talks about, I'm sure you're reading over my shoulder, new challenges with things like new platforms that are becoming mission critical, Couchbase, Mongo, and so on. Anthony's going to walk you through some interesting slides in a couple of minutes about what some of these new solutions are and how you might think about using them and where they'll fall into place in your organization. Because the days of only having a central repository or relational database or an enterprise data warehouse have quickly disappeared. I know from research in the space that almost everybody in this room is dealing with multiple different platforms to solve problems right now. And as a matter of fact, only 16% of the projects right now that we see in the big data space are actually coming from the sources that we're familiar with. It used to be innovation always kind of came from, I, from the IT folks, right? We looked to the IT department to help us find where we needed to go, how we should get there, and when we were going to do it. And right now what you're starting to see is finance, marketing, sales, and the line of business are playing a very interesting role. So if you're sitting in here today and you're an uh, uh, you're an IT professional, you're in competition with these other departments and they're bringing budget to the table. They're not just asking you to innovate, they're not asking you to go off and do, could you do some big data, could you get us one of those Hadoop things, you know, make sure ours is bigger than everyone else's, I'd like a blue Hadoop, if you can find me one of those that'd be great. You kind of get that from some of these folks, but now they're actually putting their money where their mouth is. And so it allows the people in IoT, and not IoT, excuse me, IT, to find a new way to partner with these people. These are the folks that will sponsor the programs that you want to drive. And if you're on the business side, you still have to go to IT to get some of this work done. But the bottom line is, is there's a bit of a power shift underway right now. And I think that's a positive one. I think it's okay when the consumers tell us what they want and bring money to the table and budget to the table and help us get there. So let me talk about some of these unstoppable trends that are in the market. I get asked a lot, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I don't know if we're ready, or I don't know when the time is right, or if we're really being pressured to move in this direction. And I, my point today is going to be, you have no choice. The user community has changed dramatically. Is there anyone in the room who's serving less users today than they were before? They've become smart. There's a Google generation of users that are showing up on our doorstep today that expect to be able to do things with information in a way that our traditional systems are probably not very well designed to cater to. And so when that happens, you get this democratization effect and this self-service demand. I, I don't want to wait for IT anymore. I want to drive my own tools. I want to have my own aha moments. I don't want to wait six months for someone to show me where the data is. Just give me a tool and let me go to work. And when that happens, that puts pressure on what we're doing and starts to cause change. And then you have the technologies, right? There's all kinds of very cool things happening in the technology space. I, I've been in this space since the early 90s, and I started off as a member of the press. I used to write some of those articles about new technology, and frankly, things got a little boring for a little while there. About five years ago, there was not a whole lot of new and exciting things going on, and suddenly, kaboom, in database, in memory, right, Hadoop, Cassandra, Mongo, big data in general, all of these new platforms started to find their way into our space and things got pretty darn interesting again. But once again, these new technologies are allowing us to do things at a speed that we couldn't do before. For those of you who do advanced analytics, you guys remember applying a model to a pile of data and then going to lunch and coming back and still not having an answer. Now we can iterate, we can move faster with information which allows us to do things I think that is a lot more exciting. The economic side, I think, is great. The open source community continues to innovate. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that Hadoop is free and you can download it online. You can go to the Apache website. I have a cute saying about that. Uh, Hadoop is probably free like a puppy. You know, they'll give you the puppy for free, but you still have to take it to the vet and you have to buy it food and you have to have the care and maintenance. And the same is true with Hadoop and a lot of the other new technologies. Anthony will probably touch on some of that on his slides today. And then, of course, there's the data. 
Some of it's old and traditional that we were forced to ignore. I mean, a lot of us have read articles over the years about 20% of data from the enterprises being leveraged, the other 80% is just off to the side being ignored. You don't read those articles much anymore. As a matter of fact, here at Dell, we feel that value is found if you're addressing all of the data. And now we have the tools that allow us to do that. So we have traditional information that we couldn't process and leverage before. We have new data sets like social data is kind of brand new to the enterprise as a source. And then we can look back at traditional data that we couldn't touch like IoT and so on that allows us to do things and infuse our business with greater opportunity for insight. So smarter, more demanding users, brand new technologies, Brand new economic advantages and brand new and access to traditional data puts us in a position where we're able to do things we couldn't do before and where our overall pressures against our solutions, our platforms within our enterprise are under siege. You can't stop those four things from happening and because all four of them are happening at the same time, there's really no place for us to go but to look at new solutions, new platforms and new ways to do our business. A little bit more research, data management strategies and issues from the stakeholders uh, talk about some of these challenges. And, and I, I don't always like to stand in front of a room and go, guess what, we found the new bright shiny toy and this is the answer to all of your problems. Along with big data and innovation always comes a handful of challenges. But these challenges are ones I think we're probably used to. Poor data management, strategy issues, stakeholder issues. I think that sounds like just about any project we tend to take to market. But the point I like to make here is, is that you can't forget the standard things when we're looking at innovative technologies. Just because you've stumbled upon a new data platform that lets you do things that you couldn't do before, doesn't mean you want to abandon the, the best practices that you already have in place. I've met a lot of companies who ran out and bought themselves a Hadoop, and they collected data in it, and they filled it up. And then they call someone and go, so we got all this data, we don't know what to do. You know? So the, the best practices that we're used to needs to be applied. I have a, a cute one for, you know, you go out and you buy Hadoop and you archive a bunch of data in it and you keep dumping in it and pretty soon instead of having Hadoop, you have a Hadump. And once you've got this Hadump, you're going to need to figure out how to leverage it and that's a problem. So I don't want to come off today sounding like, hey, everything is perfect and easy when we look at big data. I think the opportunity is fabulous, but I think you also have to remember some of the basics. This is the hybrid data ecosystem, and I just want to talk about it for a moment or two. It's a, a thing that I designed when I was a, a research analyst in our space, and it talks about, it's a different way of looking at what I've been discussing. If you look at the circle around the outside, there's all these different users, and I made that point early on in the discussion, right? And notice the guy with the mohawk and the t-shirt over there about eight o'clock. Uh, data scientists and new people have entered our data world, and they're demanding new things. And if you look at the next ring, they want to do analytics, operate operational analytics, operational processes, exploration, they want to dig around the data, and each one of those guys around the outside wants to put a new pressure and a new demand on our systems. And so it's up to us to put the right platforms in place to keep all of those people around the outside happy doing what they want. And I get asked a lot, well, what do those platforms look like? And Anthony's going to talk about a few different versions of what those inner circles are about, so I'm not going to spend much time there. But the center of this is where the payoff is. What you want to think about when you're thinking about where should I go for my next solution, you need to think about, am I looking for an economic advantage? How am I going to load the data? How am I going to, what kind of response do I want? Am I looking for uh, highly structured information? Do I want to do highly complex workloads? Those five bubbles in the center are the things that you want to give some thought to as you start looking at these new solutions. And at the same time, keep in mind that you have this outer circle of people that you need to serve and assist. A little bit more research, I said uh, a couple moments ago, I'll bet that most of you here in the room have two or three solutions for driving what you're doing today instead of that one that we all had 10 or 12 years ago. Research from uh, Enterprise Management Associates a year or so ago, if you start doing the math around the circle, 27% of the people that took the survey are dealing with three of those different platforms right now. Is there anybody here that's got at least three solutions in their data environment? Only two of you? Okay, three, all right. Two? So the rest of you have four or more? That's interesting, 
Okay. Huh. Or you're, you all ate too much food for lunch. So let's talk about addressing the data challenges in a holistic sort of way. Um, and it may be in a modular way as well. So let me talk about how Dell looks at things. If you're going to go into the big data world and you want to be successful with what you want to accomplish there, one of the things that you need to be thinking about is where analytics plays a role. All too often I see people create new data platforms, but they don't understand how they're going to get the payoff. Collecting data is not a hobby, right? We want to be able to get insight from it, make decisions, and take action in ways that are smart. And so analytics definitely needs to be part of what you're thinking about. And it is part of the solutions that Dell brings to big data and some of the things that we think about. Obviously, data integration is another one that becomes rather interesting. I've been talking about different platforms. I'm talking about using the right platform with the right data for the right purpose you have to be able to integrate the information. And all too often, data is actually coming from the outside as well. It doesn't all come from within the firewalls of our business. We're introducing third party and partner data to our analytics and our big data projects to add value, but it also, of course, adds complexity. So you need to look for smart and interesting ways to integrate the information. Overall, data management becomes more important because the more sophisticated your environment is, the more important it is to have repeatable, automatic, governable data management practices and tools around you. You can't live in a manual world around data management today if you're going to take advantage of things like big data. And if your company is still kind of stuck in that world where you're dealing with things in a very sort of non-repeatable, manual fashion, you're going to find yourself not innovating with big data in a way that you would expect. So I urge you to think about that as well. And then last but not least, you have to have the proper infrastructure underneath you. And Anthony's going to talk to you about some of the infrastructure choices and how to make them in a minute. But hopefully this is all sort of tied together on the things that this is what Dell thinks about. And what's happening in the world around you right now is, is that we are entering a very diverse world. I think the diversity is a great idea. It's okay that we're getting away from just having a relational database. And if you're not convinced of that, I urge you to think harder about it. Because I do think that there is a great opportunity that lies there for everybody, especially if you want to do things like big data, to use the right tools and the right platforms and to have a more diverse, or in the case of my research, have a hybrid approach to serving all of those users with these different needs. Because otherwise, they'll just keep breaking your stuff. And uh, that seems to be pretty consistent. Last but not least, if you're going to do these things, you have to have security. And we think that you need help, too. And, and one of the things that Dell's good at is, is we do have the services side of this. So um, we're able to come in and help you understand this. The worst thing you can do is get involved with big data and not have that end game and not have the expertise to get there. Remember, skill gaps was on that piece of research a minute ago as one of the concerns. So as you bring new platforms in, rely upon a trusted post, uh, uh, partner who can come in and help you understand these new solutions and help you move a little quicker. Last but not least, if you're going to get involved with it, you got to you got to have the full deal, right? You have to have a, a significant partner uh, and platform ecosystem. Dell brings that in its big data strategy. And lastly, you want to be modular. You want to be aimed at getting at all the data, as I mentioned a minute or two ago. I think that that's where the opportunity lies. Turning our back on information is not something we need to do today. Today, what we need to do is have the right strategy for the right platform to bring it and put it where it needs to be so that we can do the right things with it to drive our businesses. So let me kind of focus, or have you focus, maybe, on one of, that, one of the corners and the data management side and, and have you discuss that a little bit. So Anthony Dina, folks. Uh, pure disclosure, <clears throat> um, I live in central Texas. And one of the conditions that you'll find in Central Texas, particularly right now, is that the ragweed and the pollen are at its worst. So what you're hearing is this raspy voice, not built from talking too much, but built from a lot of allergens. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, I want to talk to you about several key technologies. My, my role at Dell is to essentially pioneer and incubate um, what's emerging. Um, I, feel like I'm really a Californian, and, and one of the reasons why that makes me proud 
uh, is there's a lot of innovation that's been happening in Northern California in the large internet properties. And when you say, well, that's interesting, but why is that relevant for me? I'm a school or I'm a hospital. I don't, I'm not Facebook. I don't care. Well, about uh, 15 years ago, 18, 20 years ago, when I joined the industry, we would oftentimes look at the financial sector as the bellwether. They were the ones that were pushing the envelope on risk modeling and were driving performance and retention of data at its peak. But I'll promise you that what's happening is a, 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 um, an evolution of where the powerhouse is. And the, and the properties like um, Uber and Facebook and the rest, you've heard endlessly in this conference, are actually driving the adoption models. And in so, they're driving some new technologies. And I think it's time to pay really close attention to them. So I'm just going to walk you through about four of them to just kind of give you an idea. Now, some of you may be mildly familiar. Some of you may be experts and should be at the front of the stadium, uh, the podium here. I'm going to try to kind of level set. The first and most talked about element of big data is Hadoop. Hadoop's been around for about 10 years. Happy birthday, Hadoop. It began at Google. It was a paper that was released. Um, Yahoo commercialized it, if you will. It became an open source. It's uh, now managed under Apache. Uh, it is free to download. And like a puppy, you can spend the rest of your life chasing after the messes uh, in the kitchen. Um, there are various distributions. Uh, Cloudera, as an example. Hortonworks is another one. MapR, those are the three. After that, you've pretty much conquered about 80 or 90 percent of all uh, uses. But essentially, it's built on this really fundamental idea that if you're going to map the internet, you have to do two really basic things. You need to build a file system that's going to be large enough to handle um, uh, data. And we're measured in petabytes, not in gigabytes or even terabytes. And then secondly, we have to way to process that data to index it. Now, the fundamentals for that are um, a file system that was purpose-built to be scaled and measured over multiple nodes in a cluster. The second piece is this map reduce function. It's a computational framework, but it's a batch framework. It was meant to be done not in real time. And this is an important distinction. Map reduce is exactly how you understand um, and decompose to the essential uh, elements. Now, over time, over these 10 years, a lot of tools have been built around it. There's a very strong ecosystem, and it's important because um, the digital natives, <laughs> Right, that grew up with a smartphone in their hand are still emerging through high school. And so for the aged, like myself, who are used to standard SQL queries, we need to have an access point for the operating model that we have and the data set that we've collected. And so you're going to see projects like Hive or Pig be that interface that we can leverage our expertise, not having to really train anybody. Now, <clears throat> it has a tremendous value. And I'll just give you a real simple one. Uh, at Dell, we made the silly decision to improve customer experience. Um, and in doing so, we collected all of these log files from the millions of systems that we sent out. Now, you'd probably say, that's not a really big deal. Um, but that meant that we went from retaining our data warehouse of about 300 to 400 terabytes to about 700, right? So we went in a very expensive way, collecting many small data objects, OK? So when you're using a system that's built on lots of processors in a distributed uh, file system, you can now process that information, retain that information. We went from spending $17 a gigabyte to 21 cents. I mean, that's a big difference. The second uh, technology I want to introduce to you is actually not that new, but it's relatively unknown. If you go to any of the conferences <coughs> for big data, you're going to hear it being discussed in great frequency. But like teenage sex, there's oftentimes more talk than there's actual use. So Spark is a computational framework for doing uh, in-memory uh, uh, processing. This is relatively important when we deal with streaming. And I'm going to give you some very explicit use cases of why you'd be interested in this. For example, the first one might be um, a casino who's looking at people who are uh, inside uh, guests, if you will, inside of their domain and want to make sure that as they progress through the casino and their experience over the course of the evening, that they stay in the casino. Because the minute they leave, they're not likely to return. That kind of investigation and interactive, interactive analytics is incredibly important. I'll give you another one. Uh, at a Howard Hughes Institute, you have neuroscientists that are trying to map 
the brain <clears throat> of angelfish. Why angelfish? Because there's a translucent layer, and they can literally take three-dimensional pictures of the brain's anatomy, and with an isotope, be able to determine what lights up. Where's the electrical impulse? So as they poke the fish, they want to know where it actually lights up in the brain. And this helps determine, from a science perspective, how the brain is mapped, OK? That, those frameworks are absolutely critical for being able to go do that very highly interactive. Now, it's a processing frame, framework. It's not a file system. So it's going to live on top of traditional, I call them traditional, but more than non-traditionals, a data store like Cassandra or S3 or even the Hadoop file system. It's relatively new. If you were to listen to the Bank of America uh, use case, you'd find is that they spent years trying to perfect it from uh, the .8 release to the 1.0 release. But it is powerful, because when you're dealing with important events like fraud detection, it becomes relevant, because any kind of theft or uh, posing could pr uh, present a real risk. The third area uh, is, wh is what we call NoSQL uh, environments. And this should not be considered a not a SQL. This should be considered a not only SQL. Now, it was built under the assumption that we needed to have a very large data store that could scale. If you were uh, building out a system of engagement because you're Facebook, and you wanted to have a place where people were going to upload documents or photos, you needed a place to store it. Traditional database stores were not going to handle it. Traditional file stores were not going to handle it. So these database structures are incredibly important. <coughs> but it, it's a different mindset. Traditional mindsets really believe in what we call acid compliance. Um, and that meant there's isolation, there's consistency, and this other world, it's consistent but it's consistent eventually. It's a different prospect. We want our transaction records to be held tight and to be uh, done well and very consistent. But if somebody has a picture of Miley Cyrus or some other construct, it's not so important. An individual loss is, uh, uh, is not as important. So, but in this mindset, and this becomes incredibly important, that you're building out a large, expansive construct to be able to hold that information. And I'm going to give you a very powerful use case, and I'm going to direct you, please, to go visit that. Um, and it's a non-SQL database. And I'm, this is just one example. The company is called Aerospike. Um, there is an example today where a, um, a company is actually doing real-time fraud detection with millions of simultaneous connections in less than 750 milliseconds. Now, let me make sure you really understand how impressive that is. There are 30 billion data objects they'd have to sort through in 100 terabytes worth of information. Millions of simultaneous queries, of which there are about 17 on average um, uh, consecutive uh, uh, searches, all being done in less than a second. Okay, So we're talking about really high potent search queries. Now, this cannot be done, or cannot be done in a stable and predictable way in traditional data stores, like an Oracle or MySQL or a uh, Microsoft SQL uh, database. But you can see how these internet properties, which have started with Miley Cyrus photos, are now turning towards mission critical and very interesting use cases to do real-time detection and intrusion. Now, um, the tool sets are relatively new. The security is not exactly uh, up to speed. But as the um, industry grows, you'll, you should expect broader and broader use. Now, I'd invite you to come down to the Samsung booth to go visit with Young Pike and Aerospike, learn about the specific use case. There is a, a white paper that Dell, Samsung, and Aerospike have just published, I think, as of today. It'll show you the results and measured in microseconds. And it's worth your time as you're thinking about building out these infrastructures to handle the all data and to handle all data at high performance uh, expectations that you have a look at these things. Now, the last thing is technology that's relatively new. And it's a major company bet on uh, SAP's behalf. They understood early on that transaction processing here and data analytics here was an untenable situation. They knew 
copying the data from one place to another because this one was meant for recording the information and this one was meant for analyzing the information was not the right way to think about it. x86 standard-based technology has plummeted the price of computing. The cost percent has never been lower. Memory prices, likewise, have never been uh, lower. So in its essential design, HANA is a system that merges the, what they call the business warehouse and the transaction processing into a single entity. Now, I said they bet their company on this, uh, this construct, and that's because they're now writing applications that will be native, S4 native, to this construct where OLAP and OLTP are together and unified. Now, Dell uses this technology. In fact, Dell has used all of the technologies I've mentioned today. But in this case, we had a very specific business problem. If you think about the size of a company that we are, we have hundreds of thousands of SKUs in many geographies with hundreds of thousands of salespeople, both badged by Dell and partners. So when you're trying to find an optimized model for going to market, right? You're in a new market with a product that you may be introducing. Who is the best person to go represent that? Is it a reseller? Who has the best track record? What have they sold with us before? You understand, this is, these are real, honest business problems. Now, we surveyed, surveyed the landscape and determined that this in-memory business warehouse and analytics modeling studio was precisely the way to go do it. Now, the advantages, of course, are high speed, uh, great tool sets, and a well-established company. Uh, the difference is um, you are now bought into the family of products with SAP. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to use all SAP applications, but you are trending in that direction. Now that, my friends, is a very simple overview of some of the hottest technology in the big data and analytics space. But I really firmly believe that if you're going to be successful, if you're going to tackle the, the tiger around this digital transformation, you should be a, a, addressing at least one, if not more, of these technologies and finding ways to put them into um, uh, the, the pattern of success. Now, we want to take you through a couple use cases, and the first of which my good friend Sean will tell you about. So this one's interesting, um, uh, very interesting. As a matter of fact, the gentleman, uh, Dr. Cromwell, is here on site today, and this is, this is a great one. The surgeons at the University of Iowa uh, hospitals and clinics wanted to impact one of the most critical things that happens in the operating room, which is post-op infections. And the trouble with it is, is that you always find out afterwards, right? And you always have insights after, but it's difficult, obviously, to take action uh, during a surgery. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to bring analytics and big data into the operating theater and actually be able to get insight and take action on how they're treating their patients in real time. And it's a classic uh, example of how frankly how cool <laughs> uh, big data can be and how it can impact uh, both sides of the business for a hospital um, you know one of the the best things or one of the best things is, is of course uh, being able to take action in an operating room allows us to treat patients better um, and that was certainly one of the things that they were looking to increase. But there's also a business side to healthcare, and uh, and it's very expensive when uh, when patients uh, end up with infections. So if they're able to reduce this, this was uh, this was their goal. And yeah. uh, you know, and I think it speaks to what I said earlier, which is, you know, we're at a place where this stuff is real. It's not just buzz. Exactly. So to 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 do this process correctly, and being the technologist and thinking on behalf of the administrators and the physicians, I know that I'd have to supply information in real time at the, as, as Sean described, in the theater, right? So we need to present information that is both demographic about the population. I also need to know what happened in the surgical room and the caseload uh, for the hospital at that time. Those are, if we look at the history of infections and we map them back to where we see conditions that increase the probability for the secondary infection, we know that there are certain factors. And so if I have the information presented, whether it's based on the demographic information, whether I have specific operative or even patient record information all presented to me, I know that I can take step, certain steps, whether maybe reducing the number of, of, of procedural time, which means it reduces the amount of time that uh, infection can get inside the wound, or whether certain steps that I need to take extra precaution. Now the results, as Sean des described, is that in this case, 
which you can <laughs> meet the physician yourself, reduce the occurrences by 58%. There's a regulatory Im implication here, not just a cost implication of, of the longer admittance, but there are certain factors and health scores that hospitals are under, um, under inspection for. So to the degree that they are improving patient care, not only do they make happier patients and happier insurance companies and happier administrators, they also take the regulators off their back. And so looking at that from a personalized healthcare perspective to drive better patient outcome, it's a win-win. Now, this isn't the only success story we want to share with you. We have one more. And this one's from Merkel, a marketing agency uh, that analyzes customer data on behalf of their clients, which we're seeing an awful lot nowadays, right? Customers are becoming sort of service bureaus to a community of clients. And the ability to do it with large amounts of data that are both structured and unstructured, which, you know, getting back to this technical side of, of big data, that's kind of what we're talking about, all the data, right, you know, all types, that, that starts to create an issue. And these, this particular company was looking for a better way to manage marketing campaigns on behalf of their clients and customers and to do it faster, smarter, and with a higher level of accuracy. Yeah. In fact, um, Sean Strand from Merkel is here, and I'll be on a customer panel with him tomorrow. So if you would like to, again, meet the person at the epicenter of this, it's a great session. Uh, it, I can, if you see me afterwards, I'll tell you precisely the room and the time. Uh, for them, uh, they need to understand a lot more. And if you're dealing in the world of, of marketing, uh, understanding your customer and every time you do an interaction is a key component. Uh, did they download that white paper? How often did they come to the site before they came into the store? How do I link all that information together? What kind of person are they from a demographic perspective? Because there are certain key trends that may suggest what happens? What zip code do they live in, as an example? So all of this purchased social media data comes relevant. Now, in order to store all of this, they used, of course, a Hadoop um, to, in order to do the processing. This gave them a 7 to 10x performance increase in terms of crunching that information and getting to the end result. They knew what to do. They were stuck because they decided to increase the amount of information that was available to them. Now, as I said before, the tool sets are available, the capabilities are there, but we wanted to do one step further. And so we're going to give you a little bit of a scene. This is completely unrehearsed. Oh, so we're going to have a little bit of fun that. with this. Michael described very acutely today and last year this notion of digital disruption. Quite honestly, it affects everyone. And the case that comes to mind for me that is just irrefutable as a foodie is that my favorite grocery store, like any grocery store, could be displaced. Now in this scenario, what we're going to describe is a place where a large internet property that likes to do distribution is going to put and provide a service which will do same day grocery delivery. Okay? So imagine that scenario and you're, let's say, the most popular grocer in your area. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to come to someone like you in the organization and, and present the business problem. And the business problem is, I'm being disrupted. And I'm being disrupted in a way that if I don't react to it almost immediately, this disruptive company could crush me in my market, which frankly is something that I think a lot of companies are dealing with. So specific to this grocery store theme, I need to retool my warehouses. I need to retool how I do uh, interactions with my customers. And ultimately, in a very short period of time, I need you to help me become a delivery grocery entity versus a traditional one. Well, as I can tell you right now, it's, been a, it's a real treat that since you're the general manager of sales and you've come to me with this business problem as a CIO, I feel honored that you're treating me as a partner in this. But I know quite literally that I don't really have a big IT shop. We just buy a bunch of groceries, we know our inventories, we have warehouse and distribution centers, and when the romaine lettuce goes down, we just stock more. So if you want me to provide intellectual property and information technology to you for distribution business, it's going to radically change. Are you going to be looking at different kinds of reports? Do I have to prepare for that? So I need to be able to drive my business 
digitally with information because I'm getting into a whole new line of business. So my ask of you is to help meet those needs, help me be able to compare my uh, brick and mortar performance to my online performance. I need you to supply me with the e-commerce uh, front end so that I can collect the data on the customers and collect the information that I need as I do this new style of business. And, and I'm not afraid to take business chances here my demand or my solid ask to you is to do it right and to do it quickly. Wow, so first of all, what I'm thinking is, number one, we have an internet presence and we offer coupons that people can download and clip, but we don't have an online transaction because we don't normally ship groceries which are highly perishable. We certainly don't mail them, but to do it in a, that means I'm gonna have to build out a data uh, construct, and I'm not really sure that my traditional Oracle data warehouse is going to be the right model for this. How many customers do we expect to have in the first year? Well, we're the most popular grocery chain in this, in, in this, in this region, so we have hundreds of thousands of customers, and I expect, because I like to assume that we're well-loved, that all of them are going to use this service. So it needs to scale in a way that would scale like one of our outlets. It yeah. needs to scale in the biggest of ways. And I understand it's going to create new data challenges, but we need to capture it all, we need to keep it, we need to leverage it, and we need to use that information for me to change significantly to disrupt my own business uh, as this competition hits. So who's going to do delivery? Are you, are you expecting to hire a fleet of vehicles and new drivers? We're going to do what it takes. You know, if I have to call Lyft, if I have to, you know, do a partnership with Uber to get these groceries delivered, I'll do that for a short time. But once we operationalize this, I need to be able to take a more uh, thought out professional view of it. I need to monitor the temperature of the foods. I need to meet regulations for deliveries. I can't have lettuce going bad and it's got to run as good as my store. And this is at the point where I start wondering, can they help me? Is there enough agility within the systems to help me? Are well, we so stringent in our data approach, do we have that flexibility? And those are questions you're gonna ask yourself when you go to your partners and, and ask these types of questions. And I know if we use data, uh, Uber or Lyft, I'm probably gonna have to find a way to do the integration between the way they interact with the customers or how I connect back to them. So I have to start thinking about how the applications talk to each other and whether or not the mapping programs that they're using, whether they're using the traditional uh, Waze or Google Maps or now in this case Bing Maps and how that may relate back to inventory. Because now all of a sudden my inventory collection reporting that I've got to hand over to the GM is not just about the warehouses and what's on the floor, it's what's in transit at any given moment. Now the temperature thing has me the most excited because now I have some, not just some opportunities <clears throat> to, to make sure, but now we can maybe possibly uh, uh, instrument and get more information. In fact, what aspiration would you have about growing this business? Let's assume we're as successful doing uh, basic delivery. What would you want to go to the, to the next step? So I can prepare to build that infrastructure, build out the platforms to allow us to scale. What do you we, want to really do? You know, the, the real thing I need to do is, is I need to meet this disruptive force in a way where we can do similar and beyond. I need to retool my business. This sort of, this has been coming for a lot longer than I can recall, right? This is something that we've been dreading. But now I have to take a brick and mortar business and turn it into a digitally driven business. And I have to be able to have access to information that allows me to operate at a level that I haven't operated before. I need to redo the way we do our business. And I want to do it in this fashion. So buying online, but then returning it in the store, that Absolutely. should be normal. Yep. Um, any Marketing for promotions that I yeah. might have in the brick and mortar, I'm going to need them and want them to flow through to our online customers. So I'm going to need to understand who the online customer is in a brick and mortar situation as well as uh, one uh, that's online. I'm going to need a loyalty system that stretches across both entities, one that works in brick and mortar and one that works online. Because I can't allow my customer to start feeling undervalued in either one of those types of transactions. So as they choose how they want to do business with us, I want to meet their needs on that field evenly. Yeah. Well, you know, we just uh, had Austin City Limits. We had hundreds of thousands of people here in Austin. I mean, I'm really pumped about this idea that we could use the calendar events that are not even in our own systems of record. But that means we're going to have to rely on that integration and do some predictive models. 
They have to know that maybe if, if it's Hatch Chili Weekend or the Hatch Chili Month and it's raining out, or maybe it's not raining out, what it might do in terms of the purchase delivery. I'm, I'm really excited that we can start loading up uh, Uber or Lyft or even our own drivers and putting some pre-stocked ingredients on the inside that we know people do. And we're going to be even cooler, impulse buy. Impulse buy. Delivery at the time of sale or time of delivery. Give them a chance to buy even upsell because you know that's a big part of our business. But to do that, I'm going to need some analytics around that. That means I'm going to have to understand the purchase patterns on, and use some aggression analytic models. But here's the one thing that scares me the most that I can't tell the GM right at the minute is we grew up as a grocery store and the technologies that we're using are very traditional trans systems of transaction records. But I don't have anyone who, who speaks Python or Java. I don't have these digital natives. So I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need to start retraining and retooling uh, my folks to understand the NoSQL data constructs, even though they know Oracle. I know those are all the things that I'm going to have to do to help my partner be successful, because this is what it's going to take. You know, and the takeaway for this from where I stand is, is it's a small ripple, right? A disruptive force comes into your market, and it seems like just that. And you start to have these conversations with your teammates about, all right, what new technology do we need? How are we going to approach it? And suddenly you're transforming your business. But the things that we touched on are the things that I talked about in my segment today. Analytics, standard analytics and advanced. Yep. Data integration from inside and outside sources. Data management across the entire ecosystem that we're building for big data in order to meet a disruptive need. All of those things come home at one time. And then last but not least, as you just touched on, yeah. you have to have the right infrastructure in place. You have to have the right service. You have to have the right partners. You have to be able to do it in the right fashion. So while our discussion about big data and analytics and, and being able to do new things, the simplest ripple in a business will send your business in this direction today. Yeah. The good news is, uh, there's something at the end to, to yeah. help you accomplish it. And, and there's some opportunities to, to drive differentiation that maybe if you look at who you are and your core values and you know, what you do well, a digital translation of that could be incredibly potent. So the, really the fundamental question I think we have is, are you feeling a little bit more informed or a little bit better about what's happening in, in terms of big data? If, uh, if the answer is yes, we've got a few things we'd recommend for you. Uh, the first of which is, the value of these conferences is in part meeting experts uh, from Dell and partners, but equal to or possibly even greater than is talking with your peers. You're going to find some of the better sessions or the panel sessions with uh, p folks like Merkel or the university that did the surgical operation. Go talk with them. Go see, the, go see those sessions. Talk with each other. Ask, what are you doing to get ahead of this? The second thing is, you're welcome to, to, uh, to talk with us. Now, uh, we've got a, a white paper that's being uh, published by Forrester Research. It's called A Total Economic Impact. We're about halfway done. We've presented uh, about a half a dozen or so customers that have gone through this big data journey. And they're doing a composite financial model. And the underlying theme, just as kind of my spoiler alert, the underlying theme is where Dell uh, helps to excel is to facilitate the time to value. We take the guesswork out. And this has been the hallmark of what Michael has always tried to do with his company, <coughs> which is to democratize for you know, the human initiative. So come have a look at what we've got on the showroom floor and talk to us about all the things that uh, we can do to help. And then uh, lastly, have a look at the wheel. If you come down to the, to the, uh, uh, to the expo hall, we've got all of those technologies we've kind of indicated around Dell Intellectual Property there for you to see. We've got partners like Aerospike, Samsung, Cloudera, all on the showroom floor. Ask them, talk with them about their experiences. I think in collection, you're going to find that you have opportunities that don't take a lot of effort. You can see instantaneous results. And what you're going to find, and this is very curious, um, if you look at our, when we look at our business records, customers that have purchased a Hadoop cluster, and I'm again just using this as, as an example, Within six months, they've expanded the cluster because the business understands the value. Within 12 months, they've doubled the size. And within two years, it's quadruple. It's a geometric progression. And it's not a runaway train. 
It's the fact that people understand the value of an all data mindset and really want to take advantage of it. So I think that's what we've had prepared. Sean, you want any, any last? No, I think uh, you covered it well. Uh, the comment about the floor is a good one. As you walk onto the expo floor, directly to your right is the big data and analytics sector. They have a bunch of stands there, but everything that I talked about on the wheel will be there. So the analytics folks are there. Uh, the data integration folks are there. The data management folks are all there. Uh, they're next to our services and our partners and our infrastructure folks are there. So uh, everything uh, along the line of the story that we've told today um, is at your fingertips. But I, I agree with Anthony talking to your peers and other customers who are out there doing that. If you're not thinking about big data innovation yet at your company, go back and make some noise. So I think Anthony's first point here, get inspired yeah. and go off. Don't boil the ocean, but go find a place to begin. Start working your way around that wheel and making sure that you have the right components in place. Right. And, and, and get inspired and do something innovative. Introduce a new data source into your world to enhance some of your systems. You know, like I said before, it's not about rip and replace and start over. It's about enhancing, extending, and getting more value out of the investments you have. And, and don't be afraid to add one of those new solutions to your space because they've got some pretty compelling use cases yeah. behind them. And we're here to help. So thank you very much. Thank you.